Greetings to those who watch below. It's Friday, which means it's time for another stop on our paranormal road trip. But before we start with the stories, I'd like to say thank you to those who dwell below, an exclusive channel membership that gets you shoutouts at the start of every video. So thank you to Steffi Ray, Wicked Witch, Lisa Watts, Lefty Kim, M.A. Way, Julie B, Jess Black Curtain, Christina Groves, and Matthew Colgan. Also, just so you know, by next week I should hopefully be in my new office and all set up, which means the Brimstone Bites videos will be starting to go live on Instagram and Facebook, so make sure you keep an eye out for those. But for now, it's time for some truly terrifying paranormal encounters from the state of Illinois. The Midnight Watch by Agochoa My story takes place in RTC Great Lakes, Illinois, which is a US Navy boot camp. What a place. It has been around since 1905 and has trained many sailors through its years. The overall environment and experience of the place puts ghosts completely out of the mind. As a recruit, I was given the job of starboard watch. This is one of two watch section leaders, the other being the port watch section leader. My major duties were leading the section in drill, keeping track of the compartment logbook, assigning watches or guard duty to random recruits in the compartment, and not to mention getting my head ripped off every time I failed to carry out orders given to me, or if someone else failed to carry out the orders given by me. With that said, Here's what happened during my time there. Weeks 1 to 3. The place felt naturally foreboding, even with 40 other guys. You still felt like something was going to sneak up on you and do God knows what, especially at night. I often dismissed it as homesickness or general discomfort of boot camp. Weeks 2 to 4. Every time we would sit at the front of the compartment for a lesson, you would always see something move out the corner of your eye at the back of the compartment, where nobody else was. It was strange at first, but then you realise that other recruits are constantly looking over their shoulder like you, only to see nothing at all. It became a topic of conversation, to the point where some of the guys would constantly look at the back of the compartment in hopes of catching a glimpse of whatever it was. Week 5 One of the guys constantly felt sick, every time he'd pass the door of the cleaning supply room on the other side of the head area. On another occasion while showering, the knob for my shower head turned itself until the water shut off. I turned to the guy waiting and he said, I guess he's trying to tell you you're done. I asked, who? He said, the ghost, and then he laughed it off. Week 6 The activity started to become more frequent in occurrence, at night you would feel a gust of air rush behind the head of your bunk as if someone was running past, only to see nobody there. I didn't think much of it until the third night, when I looked to my left to see a Mexican wave-like reaction working its way towards me. One by one, each individual recruit seemed to take notice of the weird sensation. Week 7-8 to eight. The laundry bags are hung in bags in the washroom resembling a meat locker. The same recruit who became ill at passing the door grabbed me and told me to take a look. He said upon entry all six of the bags were hanging at angles as if someone were holding them there. By the time I'd arrived they were all swinging as if they had just been released from a grip. One of my watchstanders, a very intelligent level-minded recruit by the name of Parker, accompanied me on what was nearly the last of our watches until graduation, the Midnight Watch. It was just past midnight. He took the forward part of the compartment and I took the back. Armed with flashlights, guard belts and canteens, we were ready to take on anyone. I remember peeking out of the back window, which led to the fire escape, to ensure that nobody was paying us an unpleasant visit. I glanced over my shoulder to see who I thought was Parker, and I turned slightly and said, Parker, get back forward. Whatever was there kept walking past, and vanished into the back wall before I could see what it was. It made no sound at all. I was completely freaked out at this point. I moved very quickly to the front to tell Parker what had happened, only to hear him scream and come running out of the bathroom like a bat out of hell. He said, I saw it, I saw it. He said he was just doing a routine check of the cleaning supply room, 
When he opened the door, he saw a recruit standing there, just huddled in the corner staring off into space. He wasn't wearing the proper uniform, which was odd. Parker thought it was a joke, until the recruit vanished into thin air. After that, neither one of us could sleep. Graduation Day Our recruit divisional commanders gave us a brief pep talk about going off into the fleet and what not. One of them had told us that things like that have been going on for some time in our building. It has seen recruits through two major wars and a fair share of conflicts in between. Sadly, some recruits never got to see graduation. There have been a few accidental deaths at random points in history involving training. A chief had supposedly hung himself in the floor above ours some 40 to 50 years before. It is truly a place of great physical and emotional investment. Even nearly 10 years on, I never forget that night on the Midnight Watch. Bachelor's Grove Bachelor's Grove Cemetery at 5900 West Midlothian Turnpike in Midlothian has been at the centre of conversations of paranormal activity and haunts in Illinois. In fact, the cemetery's website states that the amount of information available on the subject of the paranormal as it relates to Bachelor's Grove Cemetery would encompass a book. Now inactive, Bachelor's Grove Cemetery is one of the oldest in Cook County, but its history is still alive and well. According to a piece written by Brad Bettenhausen, president of the Tinley Park Historical Society, the Batchelder family, who were early settlers near this grove, was known to have been living in Rich Township by 1845, and it is very likely that this is how Bachelor's Grove got its name. However, according to the claims of Stephen Rexford, who settled there with three other men in 1833 or 1834, the settlement was named for the group of single men. According to the cemetery's website, stories centred on paranormal activity there began circulating as far back as the 1950s. It became a favourite hangout for local youths, and once the Midlothian Turnpike closed, vandalism increased, peaking in the 1970s, in addition to evidence of grave openings, robberies, and satanic rituals, the cemetery added. Families would even relocate their ancestors buried at Bachelor's Grove, to other more prestigious cemeteries. Bachelor's Grove is also famous for being the rumoured site of the White Lady, or Madonna, of Bachelor's Grove, who, according to legend, was buried next to her child, and whose apparition can be seen holding a baby in her arms. While it's okay to visit the cemetery during the day, police are always on the lookout for nighttime trespassers, unless you're part of an authorised tour. Also known as Mrs. Rogers and Woman in White, a piece written by Peter Crapier, founder of the Bachelors Grove Cemetery and Settlement Research Centre, reports the legendary story dates back to 1982. In the 2000 book Beyond the Grave, on page 224, it states, Photos taken by the group in 1979 show a monk-like figure standing near the cemetery fence. The figure appeared to be wearing a hooded robe, and holding a baby in its arms. It then goes on to mention, Oddly, this was three years before the Ghost Research Society collected any accounts of the White Lady. Another legend among the phenomena reported at or near the cemetery is that of the Phantom Dog. In a piece written by Crapier, he describes the legend of the dog. The legend of the Phantom Dog can be traced back as far as the late 1980s, the first sighting is said to have occurred while two young men were visiting the cemetery. As one of them was walking around inside, he witnessed strange flickering lights within the flora. According to the witness, he could not find an explanation for the lights, and that there was no object in the area that could have caused a reflection of some sort. Upon turning around, he then witnessed the backside of a black dog, and it faded away into what was described as nothingness. Driving Through Cornfields at Night by Trudy82 I grew up in Illinois and I experienced many paranormal things there. What I would like to tell you about are the experiences I had during a period of six months in college. 
when I was taking horseback riding lessons off campus. In order to get there, I had to drive through unlit pitch black back roads, through miles of cornfields in the evening. It was late four, so it was very dark by five when I left for lessons. Every two weeks I would drive out there, and I had a few different experiences on the long roads through the cornfields. First of all, every time I drove out there, I always saw little balls of light flying around. I assumed they were fireflies or dust or something at first, but when I noticed that they were always different colours, like pink or green or yellow, I began to wonder. I would always see them though, usually floating across the road in front of my car, or floating down the road right toward my car and over it. One night it was particularly dark, and I was the only car on the road. Suddenly ahead of me, I saw this massive tall rectangle that was even blacker than the night around me. It was a perfect rectangle, like a great big oversized door, and it was on my side of the road, but hovering maybe a foot off the road. It looked like a portal, but I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me for sure, so I rubbed them, blinked, squinted, but it was still there, and getting closer. I moved my head way over from side to side, and the road, corn and stars disappeared behind it as I did so, so it was something solid, or at least real. There was now a car behind me, and the portal, or whatever it was, was getting bigger and bigger really fast, so I was sweating what to do. Finally, at the last moment, I braked hard and swerved into the left lane and back again, skirting around it. When I looked in my rearview mirror, and the car behind me had just gone straight, not seeing what I had, and when I turned around, the portal wasn't visible anymore. Weird. The scariest thing that ever happened was one night I was really happy, singing along loudly to a bouncy happy song on the radio. All of a sudden in one instant, all the hair on the back of my neck and on the top of my head rose a bit, and although I couldn't physically see it, I knew that something was reaching out really fast from the floorboard of the passenger seat with a scaly clawed hand to grab my right leg. I screamed at the top of my lungs and swerved into the left lane. Luckily again, I was the only car on the road. My memory is a little fuzzy about this part, but I think my scream made the feeling go away. So I continued on down the road and tried to get back into my happy singing. But a few moments later, it happened again, and it was reaching even faster, as if it were trying to reach me before I could scream. But I screamed really loudly, screeched to a halt, wrestled my seatbelt off, and threw myself out of the car. It was dead silence outside, with the corn blowing in the wind a bit. The happy music still playing in my car, and the beeping of my car door standing open, were the only other sounds. I stood there shaking, and breathing fast for a little while, until I was able to release all the fear and tell it very strongly and angrily to leave me alone and get out of my car. I waited until the heavy feeling of foreboding passed, and until I felt happy again, so it couldn't come back and feed off my fears when I got back into the car. Finally, I got back in and finished the drive without any more mishaps. That sure was freaky though. What a crazy stretch of road. I wonder to this day what all of those things were. Pemberton Hall Haunting by Savory Dave My ghost story took place at college, just before Christmas break, back in 1982, at the oldest women's college dormitory in the Midwest, Pemberton Hall, on the campus of Eastern Illinois University. I was in my junior year, and was dating the resident assistant on the third floor of Pemberton Hall, a sophomore named Laurie. She called me late one snowy night and asked me if she could get her typewriter back from me so she could finish a paper she had been putting off. I said yes, and that being the gallant guy that I was, I'd bring it over to her dorm if she would prop open the West Wing's back stairwell door just enough so I could get in that way. She agreed. The snow was really flying, and it was bitterly cold, as I pulled open the door to the old entranceway, slipped in, and gently pulled the door closed, so that it wouldn't slam in the wind. My errand had to be top secret, or I'd get myself, and especially Laurie, into trouble, with this late night intrusion 
into the old women's dorm. So I trudged as silently as possible up the dimly lit, echoey old stairwell, my boots dripping with melted snow, as I thought to myself that these old buildings with their high ceilings weren't very efficient in their use of space, since, as I rounded the second floor landing, the height of this four-story dorm, built back in the late 1800s, was high enough to fit a six-story dorm, if it had the modern eight-foot ceilings instead of the 16-foot ceilings used here. As I was about eight steps from the third landing's door, that was when I felt the eyes of someone looking at me from a few feet above. And when I flinchingly looked up, I glimpsed a blank pale face and blonde hair. They pulled back over the railing of the first flight of stairs, going from the third floor landing up to the fourth floor. When I was two steps from the third floor landing, I looked up again, and saw her fly up the stairs to the fourth floor without making a sound. Curses, I thought. That must have been the fourth floor resident assistant, and now I'm screwed for something as innocent and gallant as bringing a typewriter to Lorry. I pulled open the fire door to the third floor and ducked into Lorry's private room, the first door to the right. She giggled as she ran up to me with a kiss, thanking me for coming in such bad weather, but I cut her off and told her what had just happened. I've got to dump this and run back down, because the fourth floor RA saw me and ran back, probably to call the campus police. Lorry was completely stunned, you're kidding me, right? You know about Mary Hawkins, right? I told her impatiently. I don't know anything, but that we're both screwed if I don't get out of here. She looked ticked off. Now Laurie's face went pale, as she could see I was serious, and she began to tremble. The fourth floor has been closed and locked up for 60 years, ever since the murder. The person you just saw was the ghost of Mary Hawkins. The terror in her face turned to tears as she said to me, You've got to go back down the same stairs. Now! I could see that there was no other choice. I could see there was no point delaying the inevitable. And so I kissed her on the forehead, zipped on my ski jacket, pulled on my gloves, and slipped out of her room through the fire door and into the back stairwell. I did look up the stairs toward the fourth floor once, briefly. And seeing no one, I began my cautious descent down the stairs. I went slowly and deliberately at first trying hard not to let the panic inside me cause me to slip, trip or stumble. But with every step I took, the overwhelming of being watched became much more oppressive, aware of being hovered over by the ghost that I had just seen. By the time I was on the last flight, I was hurling down the stairs two or three at a time, feeling almost shoved by an oppressive presence that sucked all the air out of the stairwell, making any sound from my mouth impossible. I flew through the heavy old outside door, and it slammed shut behind me with a deafening boom that I'm sure the whole dorm heard. I walked quickly away from the building, looking back briefly and feeling like a character from a Don Knotts movie. Since these were the days before the internet, I had no way of knowing the history of Pemberton Hall, but now if you google Pemberton Hall or Mary Hawkins, you'll find considerable material on the subject. Personally. My intuition tells me that the ghost I saw that night wasn't Mary Hawkins. The ghost I saw was the nameless young co-ed who was murdered late one snowy night as she softly played the piano on the fourth floor, 60 years earlier, by a custodian on work release from a state mental hospital 10 miles from campus, who came up those same back stairs that I did, quietly like I did, but with much different motives. Homie the Clown, from an article by Isaiah Thompson. Generally speaking, it's not ghosts that make Halloween scary for Chicago school kids. It's bombers, kids who lie in wait with eggs and shaving cream for younger, weaker prey. When I was growing up, it was whispered that some bombers had filled super soakers with nair. If you got shot in the head, that was it. You were bald. But in the fall of 1991, kids were afraid of something even worse. I was a fifth grader at Murphy Elementary, and rumours circulated among my classmates for weeks, coming to a boil as Halloween approached. It wasn't safe to walk home alone. He was in our neighbourhood. Someone had seen him cruise past in his van just the other day. We called him Homie the Clown. And if you're a product of the Chicago schools, old enough to buy beer, but young enough to remember the Thundercats, 
chances are you did too. Homie the Clown, of course, was the name of a character played by Damon Wayans in the early 90s sketch comedy show In Living Colour. The character was an angry black ex-con who carried a sock for knocking bratty kids upside the head. His catchphrase you might recall was, Homie don't play that. But the homie we feared was a man dressed as a clown who'd supposedly been roaming the neighbourhood and luring children into his white van, or maybe just snatching them up and throwing them inside. No one at Murphy was too sure about the details. I remember the kids talking about it, somebody going around dressed up like Homie the Clown, said David Allison, a friend who was also in the fifth grade at Murphy that year. I want to say that he was a rapist or something. He was supposed to be driving around in a van, remembers another former classmate of mine, Bob Chang. Kids were talking about it all the time. A kid in my church, he went to another school in Chicago further north. He said he saw Homie the Clown going by his school. Chang vividly recalls a witch hunt mentality. I remember that one day, a bunch of kids from the neighbourhood and me were like, we're going to catch this guy, and we went walking around the neighbourhood looking for Homie. The more people you ask, provided they're of a certain age, the more you hear the same things, with slight variations. Sometimes Homie is a kidnapper, other times a rapist. Some remember Homie's sock, others remember his van. The van sometimes changes colour, but white leads the other hues by a wide margin. Just one detail is consistent. Homie was always nearby. It might have relieved some of us at Murphy to know that kids all over Chicago and in some suburbs thought the same thing. Dasara Redekop, who was at Andrew Jackson Language Academy on the near west side, says her classmates were so sure that he was real. That's why you had to be careful when you were waiting for your parents to pick you up. Alyssa Wellock, who went to Rogers Elementary in Rogers Park, recalls, There wasn't that much communication between the Orthodox kids and the non-Orthodox kids, but I remember that the Orthodox kids were scared of white vans too. It was clear we'd both heard the same stories. Folks who were grown-ups at the time also remember Homie. A friend of mine was volunteering at Oscar Mayer Elementary, says Murphy's second grade teacher Leanne Meredith. Then a child saw a white van go by the school playground and started screaming, It's the clown! It's the clown! And I understood that they took everyone back into the school and called the police. Even at the peak of supposed Homie sightings, however, few schools took action. Homie didn't leave many traces in the media, the few clips that could be found report sightings of a stubbornly mobile clown and the police force's increasing exasperation. On October 9, 1991, WFLD-TV ran a 30-second news spot saying the police were treating Homie the Clown as an urban legend. Two days later, the trip ran an article headlined, Police Taking Clown Sighting Seriously. On the same day, the defender quoted a South Sider who'd insisted she'd seen Homie. On October 16th, Oak Park's Wednesday Journal ran the headline, Police Dismiss Youth Sighting of Deviant Clown as Unfounded. Homie left town quietly, simply fizzling out of existence. He came and went, with no harm done. Hi guys, thank you so much for listening to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like, and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already making sure to hit that notification bell so that you never miss a video. If you'd like to suggest a state for us to visit next, make sure to let me know in the comments section. And if you have a paranormal tale that you'd love to share, make sure to send me an email, that's also down in the description box. So, until next time, sleep tight.